Hi, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the third and final session of day two. I, I hope all of you are you know, fully energized after having a cup of coffee or tea. So now I once again welcome Michael. Uh, Michael, uh, now the floor is yours. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, uh, round three. Let's see what we can do here. So I'm going to talk about, uh, we talked about the global energy challenge, talked about climate change. We bemoaned the failure of the world to listen to economists about pricing externalities. Uh, and now we're gonna say, whoa, wait a minute. Actually, it can happen. And I'm gonna tell you about uh, an experiment that I ran with uh, my co-authors, friends, uh, colleagues, Rohini Pandey, Nick, Nick Ryan, uh, and Anant uh, Sudarshan. Okay, uh, and so this is about <clears throat> an experiment that we ran uh, in, uh, in in Gujarat. Maybe. So I can, I can tell you how this started. Uh, I worked in the Obama administration uh, and I'd gone there to help design a cap and trade program for the US for CO2. Uh, and eventually that failed in the Senate. And I went back to my old job, which was uh, teaching at MIT. And I had a series of projects that were going on, ongoing in India. And I went to check in on them. And one thing led to another, and we ended up with a meeting uh, with the head of uh, Jerome Mesh, who at the time was the head of the Ministry of Environment and Forest. And I said, oh, well, you know, the United States can't do cap and trade, but uh, maybe India can do cap and trade. Uh, and, sorry. Uh, and so that was in 2010, <laughs> uh, and this is 2022. And so it took a little while to get there, uh, but we eventually, uh, devised and ran uh, this cap and trade program in Gujarat, uh, but we ran it as an experiment. I'll, I'll talk about this. There were several important uh, co conspirators. Uh, you know, the leader was Guj the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, uh, uh, JPAL, CPCB, NEML, who ran the market, the operations market behind the scenes, uh, and a lot of the industries who were regulated in this way. Uh, were textile processors, and uh, they all, most of them belong to this industry association in Surat. Okay, so we looked at this before. Uh, global concentrations of particulate matter are very high in many parts of the world. Uh, here's a map uh, illustrating that. Uh, as we talked about earlier, the gains in life expectancy from bringing those areas into compliance with uh, WHO standards are quite substantial. They're also quite heterogeneous around the world and certainly are potentially very large uh, in India. Uh, so one thing that has kind of puzzled me for a long period of time is, you know, why is it that pollution is so high in so many parts of the world? Uh, and there's, I would say probably a couple, uh, and, and, and why is it puzzling? It sure seems like, uh, benefits and costs aren't being uh, equalized. Uh, and so, you know, or at least it feels that way. So what are some explanations? One is, well, the benefits are not very large. Uh, that would imply that uh, that might be because <clears throat> there's very low willingness to pay for abatement. Maybe incomes are low and there's more important needs than air pollution. Uh, a second related one is that people's revealed willingness to pay might be low just because there's poor information about what the consequences are. Uh, and so that's, I would say, one category of explanation. 
Another category of explanation is that there's very high marginal costs of abatement. Uh, the traditional one would be that it's very expensive for plants to reduce their emissions. Uh, and uh, so even if there's high benefits, it's more expensive to reduce emissions in terms of lost economic output and economic growth. Uh, and so it's rational uh, for there to be such high levels of pollution. And then a different category of explanation that's under this high marginal cost of abatement would be it's just really hard uh, uh, bureaucratically to get enforced laws, uh, that e even laws that are on the books, uh, to get people to internalize externalities. Uh, and so that could take the form of very high cost of regulatory enforcement. Uh, it could be to weak monitoring or weak incentives by government actors. And so, you know, I'm not taking a stand on what any of these are. This paper is going to shed some evidence that uh, at least with respect to air pollution, it seems like it's uh, maybe the current regulatory systems uh, make it seem very costly to do that, even though in practice, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So we'll talk about that. So uh, it is also true, there's no shortage of laws and regulations on the books around the world. India is no exception. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, pollution is high, as we talked about. The average person in India, if you take the estimate we talked about earlier, uh, literally they would imply that the average person could live about five years longer if India's air pollution were brought in in compliance with WHO. Uh, also true in India, uh, there uh, are problem, there are challenges with state capacity. Uh, so here in the experiment that I'm going to talk to you about uh, is a histogram of plants. Uh, and uh, their emission levels. The red line is the standard, the regulatory standard. And just point out, you know, there's about a third of the plants who emit above the red line. Uh, and this is not uh, this is not uncommon. I found this in some of my previous work uh, as well. You know, why might you study this? Obviously, it's self-evidently important. Uh, in addition. Uh, Climate change is a global, or carbon is a global pollutant. And so, you know, even if you were sitting in a developed country and you didn't really care uh, about local pollution in other places, you might still care that there be successful or useful tool, regulatory tools available uh, in, uh, in developing countries. Okay, so, so a lot of this was recognized. This is a terrific quote uh, by the former PM uh, who says, I must emphasize that standards are not enough. They must also be enforced, which is often difficult. It's also necessary to ensure that these regulatory standards do not bring back the license permit Raj, which we sought to get rid of in the wake of economic reforms of the 90s. Uh, highlighting some of the challenges of having a successful policy or successful enforcement of regulation. Uh, and in the case of India, most environmental regulations are very command and control in nature, uh, have very, very specific rules that can be quite expensive. They don't take account of what the least expensive way to achieve the goal is. Uh, and a lot of that in our previous work, we thought was a, uh, a result of there aren't monetary penalties. There's just these very harsh penalties, like the regulator can shut the plant down uh, but they can't do that much in between that and waving their finger at them. Uh, and of course, shutting down a plant is not really in anyone's interest. Uh, and so then they become reluctant to use that and that kind of facilitates uh, violations. Uh, so, you know, against those challenges is uh, the great success of pollution markets uh, in many other parts of the world. Uh, the canonical pollution market is probably the US SOX market. Uh, there's also been an NOx market in the U.S., the EU ETS for carbon, and there's been some regional carbon markets uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, and so an uh, important question in all of this is, well, can you bring markets uh, to uh, settings where state capacity uh, may not be terribly high? Uh, and so in particular, what happens if there's going to be unreliable monitoring of emissions? Uh, what hap will the polluters believe that if they fail to hold the proper number of permits at the true up period or at the end of a compliance period, 
they're going to actually pen be penalized. If they don't believe that, the whole market will fall apart. Uh, and so there haven't been a lot of examples of pollution markets uh, in lower capacity settings. Uh, and so that was another reason that we thought it would be interesting to try and study this. Okay, so what is the setting? Uh, the setting is uh, the city of Surat. Uh, here is, that's Gujarat. Uh, here's uh, the, I forget, the blue ones are the plants and the black ones are the control plants or, or the other way around. Uh, we uh, did this in conjunction, or really it was led by the Gujarat Pollution Control Board and we provided advice throughout. Uh, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but it was a, there was about 340 plants. They were random, half randomly assigned treatment group, which is to be regulated with a pollution market. And the other half were just to continue to, continue to be regulated in the normal way, uh, the status quo approach. Uh, most of the plants, if you just want to get a feel for it, are textile plants, uh, and they're pretty big. Uh, they had about sales of about $13 million uh, annually, and they all self-generate uh, power, uh, almost all from coal, as we'll see as we go along. Okay, so this project had several parts. Uh, the first is this introduction of a new market. Uh, there were like a series of Baseline questions, uh, could we get the market off the ground? Would the regulator enforce it so the plants would comply? Uh, and then if yes, how expensive would it be for plants uh, to abate? Um, then the second thing that we wanted to set this up as an experiment was uh, to try and understand uh, how expensive it was uh, for plants in the treatment plant uh, and treatment group to uh, comply relative to plants in the control group. And I'm gonna talk about how we did that uh, a, 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 as we go along. Uh, and we're also gonna look at pollution uh, a, a, as an outcome. Uh, okay, so this is kind of the game plan. Uh, the data that we're gonna bring to bear on this is we did uh, a baseline survey, uh, we did some inline surveys. Uh, we have pollution measurements from, I'm gonna say the word SEMS over and over that's continuous emissions monitoring systems. Those are machines that are put on the stack and are figuring how much pollution, or recording how much pollution is coming out every, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, and then we're gonna have market data uh, from NEML, uh, ran the, the backroom operations of this market. Uh, and we're gonna have all the bids uh, that all the plants made and all the transactions that occurred in the marketplace and the, uh, we'll have results from the auctions that were done uh, quarterly or that quarterly, at the beginning of each compliance period. Uh, this is what a plant would see when they went to their computer. Uh, they would see what their emissions are. They would see how far the market is towards the cap, uh, and they could enter bids uh, to buy and sell. So how would you decide the gap? I'm gonna come to that, but why don't I give the answer now? Uh, we basically took the 150 micrograms per cubic meter, which is the concentration standard, multiplied it by the number of hours that the typical plant is open and the throughput, the, the flow through the stack, uh, and basically said, that's the cap. Uh, and, and since guys were violating, that would already be a reduction relative uh, to the cap. And that's how we initially set the cap. Uh, it turned out uh, that that was pretty loose. Uh, and so then it was ratcheted down a, a, a couple of times. But it was designed so that at least initially the stringency would be the same in the treatment group in the, uh, as already existed in the control group. The complication is then the treatment group, it's a load standard, which is all the emissions that comes out. In the co uh, control group, they're regulated by a concentration standard, which is uh, how polluted the air is at any point in time. So they amended the law to allow you to do that. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, no, they did not amend the law. We got a kind of waiver for uh, to uh, the Gujarat Pollution Control Board got a, a waiver for that. Uh, th that would that took some doing. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it helped have a very very effective head of the Gujarat Pollution Control Board at the time who getting things done. Okay. So what are the results? Uh, 
and I should say this is the world's first market for particulate air pollution. Uh, there's never been one for particulates before. The, part of the reason it's a little complicated is monitoring for particulates is more painful than gaseous pollutants. Uh, and but uh, in, in any event, this is the world's first one, and I, I, I won't spoil the ending, but the ending is exciting. Uh, okay, so the, what we found is that three basically three categories of results. Number one, the market worked uh, quite well. Uh, Firms complied they, at the end of each compliance period, they had the right number of permits. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how in the first period there was a showdown, uh, but uh, the regulator won. Um, there was pretty active trading, plans to just passively get what they were allocated and use that in a month. Uh, they did lots of trading. Uh, and the consequence, the ending permit ownership greatly from the initial allocations. Uh, and there was little evidence that firms were wasting money by not using all the permits they had. Uh, the second result, which was a little surprising, uh, given how we tried to design it, was that emissions were lower in the treatment group or the market, even though we designed it for that not to be the case. Uh, so in particular, emissions were cut by about 20 to 30 percent in the treatment group relative to the control. Uh, and uh, we think that that's because uh, the uh, the operation of the monitoring and operation of the market turned out to be a more powerful regulatory tool than the regulator had at their discretion to, uh, available to them in advance. Uh, and so this was like a huge result. Uh, pollution. Uh, these are very large reductions in pollution, and it they happen inside the treatment group relative to the control group. Uh, then the third uh, big result uh, is. Uh, that the market saved polluters about 12 to 15 percent uh, in terms of their uh, compliance costs. Uh, and this is exactly what you would expect uh, in a kind of blackboard example, uh, but showing in the real world, this is the first time there's been a true counterfactual uh, for a cap and trade program. Um, one thing that isn't on this slide, but will come out as we go along, is it's, it, we were also able to see how expensive it would be using the firm's bidding data. It would be for them uh, to comply with more stringent regulations. Uh, and so what we found is actually in the case of these plants in Surat, it would be quite inexpensive uh, for them to very substantially cut their pollution. And in fact, if you did a kind of cost benefit analysis, it looks like the benefits exceed the cost, but like maybe a ratio of 100 to 1. Uh, so it's it, it's kind of an amazing uh, set of results here. Um, okay, so we think this kind of attaches to several literatures. Uh, the first is kind of Devo literature result is, uh, can market-based regulatory instruments work uh, in developing countries or countries with weaker institutions? Uh, and the answer seems to be a resounding yes. Uh, the second uh, is everything we've known about uh, cap and trade programs have been without a true counterfactual. Uh, they've always been, we're going to put all these plants in the cap, and then we're going to compare what happens inside the market to engineering estimates of what, of what might have happened otherwise. But they're not, it's not a true counterfactual. Uh, and so here we're going to have a real treatment group and a, a real control group, and we'll be able to take a look at that. Uh, this is like a canonical graph. Uh, from uh, the SO2 program in the U.S. And, you know, there's no counterfactual for what would have happened to these same plants uh, in the absence uh, of that market. Um, okay, so we're going to get everything else done in the next hour, which is all listed here. Uh, but uh, this is kind of uh, the game plan. Uh, okay, so the first, I just want to describe what the form of regulation is the status quo that these guys had to comply with uh, normally. So the Air Act of uh, 1981 established a command and control uh, program. The way it worked is uh, the regulator had tremendous power to force plants to purchase and install air pollution control devices of varying quality and varying expense. Uh, and in fact, we're gonna find that every single plant in the sample had expensive air pollution control devices. Uh, and then the second is they also put on them a standard that 
uh, the emissions concentrations couldn't exceed 150 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, what I already showed you is this is pretty ineffective in our sample. Guys violate it all the time. Uh, and financial sanctions are largely unavailable. Uh, and so there's this game of cat and mouse that goes on for a while. And eventually, if you prove to be bad enough, the regulator can come and uh, shut you down, although it's, they don't really want to do that either. Uh, so th this is the status quo. And this is gonna be very important. I want it to stick in your mind. Uh, everybody has to have these devices. That is something the regulator can enforce. They are not there very often, and so they can't enforce that these machines are actually run, uh, but they they're, they can be the, uh, enforced that the machines are on, uh, on the plant premises. This is a graph we saw a few minutes ago just showing lots of violations. Uh, okay, so that's going to be the status quo or the control group that we're going to compare against. Uh, so how did we develop this market? As I said, uh, we originally suggested this. Uh, it's in the Ministry of Environment and Forest 2010. They had us write a little concept note about it, which is here. Uh, then there was a kind of long and windy path. The first is you got to measure the stuff. And it's a super important lesson. If you don't measure it well, it's not going to work. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time. And uh, thank goodness, Anant Siddharshan was on the team, who was an actual engineer, not just an economist. Uh, and he helped the government of India establish some standards uh, and then began uh, the process of requiring them to be installed. And eventually there was a national uh, SEMS uh, mandate. Uh, this was a little bit to your question about how we got the right to do it. Eventually, there was a waiver from uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Uh, and then the market started uh, in 2019. So there's a lot of boring details in the dot, 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 but uh, uh, this, is how, this is how it developed. Um, uh, okay, I think I said most of these things. The key thing was uh, to get the SEMs uh, installed and then to get them agree to agree that in the treatment group we could be regulated on total load across all the plants that's total pollution instead of uh, the concentration standard are in the stacks. they're in the stacks uh yes they're in the stacks uh so in the status quo how were things how was regulation actually done so they had to install these machines they had to meet these standards now how did they know if plants were meeting the standard or not, once a year, maybe twice a year, a guy from uh, the Gujarat Pollution Control Board would come out. Uh, he would climb this kind of harrowing stack uh, and stick a probe into the stack, collect in a thimble how much particulate matter the thimble was collecting. They would take it back to a lab. They would weigh it, and then there's some assessment of what uh, the concentration standard was. That happened once or twice a year. We went on several of these visits. Very frequently what happens is you show up. They say, oh, that's so great you came to inspect us. Why don't we sit down and have some tea? Let's talk about it. And then someone, like, runs out of the room, uh, and we don't see that guy again until he's on the stack conveniently where the, uh, you know, fiddling with things. Uh, so th that's kind of the standard. Uh, Yes, okay. Um, so a big deal was to get the SEMS installed. Uh, we tried to get it installed in both the treatment and the control plants. The blue guys are gonna be treatment, the black guys are gonna be the control plants. Uh, one thing we did, uh, and it was a bit of a struggle to get the SEMS installed. You can see the before uh, the market started. So here's, uh, we had a couple mock trading periods and then the real trading begins here and then there's, uh, I guess, a total of maybe 10 compliance periods. Uh, but you'll notice that things really pick up, particularly in the treatment plants, once the mock trading gets going. Now, why is that? It's because we wrote the rules. If your SEMS machine is not turned on or if your SEMS machine is behaving strangely, we're going to impute your uh, emissions at the highest level. Uh, and so now you're suddenly uh, facing, and that is going to become a financial penalty inside the market. And so. What we found is, and we hadn't thought this through very carefully in advance, is like uh, the market was a really useful tool for just getting good measurement uh, because you could use uh, the market to imp uh, impose financial penalties for failing to install the uh, equipment correctly. Um, 
So the initial cap was set at 280 tons of uh, suspended particulate matter per month based on kind of incomplete guesses on how much they operated and a series of other things. Uh, eventually that was revised down uh, to 170 tons. Uh, each compliance period, 80% of the permits were given away free based on what boiler they had before the mar any of the markets began. So uh, basically based on how big the plant was. Uh, and then 20% were auctioned by the uh, Pollution Control Board every uh, compliance period. Uh, the trading uh, were the, at the beginning of each compliance period, there was these double-sided multi-unit auctions uh, with uniform clearing prices. Uh, then there was for the counter trades uh, that were permitted uh, uh, in between each week, in between each uh, auction each week, and uh, those trades all had to be conducted at the preceding auction's price. Uh, this was a way to get some uh, price discovery going. Uh, we set a floor of five rupees per kilogram uh, and a ceiling of about 100 rupees per kilogram. Uh, this is probably, so how did we set the floor? Actually, I probably don't know how to do this. Let's see if this will work. There we go. So we had some estimates of how expensive it would be to run the various pollution abatement equipment. And that made us think uh, a floor of around five uh, was, uh, was correct. Uh-oh. Okay, so that now we're way out of order. Okay. Uh, oh, then another important feature of the market is we required every plant to post, or the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, at our suggestion, required every plant to post a bond. Uh, and that could be drawn upon if they ever if a plant ever failed the permits uh, at the end of a compliance period. Uh, and to make it worth their while to hold the right number of permits, uh, the, if you were ever short at the end of the compliance period, you had to pay two times the ceiling. So basically 200 uh, rupees per kilogram. Just to give you some sense, the clearing price was usually somewhere between the floor price of five and maybe 15 or 18 or 20. So this is like an enormous penalty, uh, which people didn't want. Banking and borrowing. No banking and borrowing. Every compliance period was its own world. Yeah, uh, sometimes six weeks, but four to six weeks. Um, I guess I'm not quite sure the right moment to say this, but so I'll just say it now. In the first compliance period, uh, there were two very big plants both of whom seemed fairly well politically connected uh, and who didn't hold enough permits at the end of the compliance period and basically stared at the regulator and said, we're not gonna pay. Uh, and so that was like the moment that's like weak capacity state meets like having to have very, very uptight rules because once one or two plants do that, then the value of the permits can go to zero uh, and the whole thing will unravel. And the regulator called us and we said, you know, this many year journey is about to end uh, or you can stand up for this. Uh, and I think he did some calling around and like pulled his breath in and he held the line. Uh, they paid the fine and there was never another problem again. It was really kind of fascinating moment. Uh, the whole thing could have fallen apart right there. So. How did you uh, put them in treatment and control? Randomized, randomized. They, they, they knew, they knew. We did it very publicly how we did it. And they were okay. They were okay with it. Yeah. By the end, people were lobbying to get into the treatment group. Uh, but in the beginning, nobody knew. Uh, okay. And we did some training, some fake markets with fake money and things like that. Um, uh, look, everyone uses coal, everyone does their own. Uh, uh, combustion on site. Uh, here's a, uh, here's how the sample was divided between the treatment and control. Uh, here's just some characteristics of the plants. We looked at it before. Uh, you know, it's about $13 million of sales. Uh, the enormous electricity users. 
typical one had one stack. Uh, everyone has pollution abatement equipment. That's because a regulator, that's something a regulator could go and visually see. And if you didn't have it, they would shut you down. Uh, these are in uh, you know the least expensive to most expensive, which is also the least effective to most effective. So everyone had a cyclone. Uh, and you know, some had to have these more expensive ones based on how big the plant was. Uh, the market started in July 19. Uh, each compliance period was four to six weeks. Uh, there was an interruption for COVID naturally uh, and a, a second one for uh, Delta. Okay, so here are the basic results. Uh, so, oh, sorry. So do you have information on the ownership structure of these plants? Like, are they part of some multi plant farms or? Some were, some were independent. It was a mix. Almost all of them did belong to this industry association, uh, but it, it was a mix of uh, independent companies and companies that had multiple plants. Like, how, like, you know, if depending on the who who the owners are they're uh, probably two of internalizing the information that you are giving might be higher or different so, so, sorry say that again depending on how educated the owner is how well exposed um oh look these guys are very uh maybe they had not been in pollution markets before these guys are super sophisticated this is a competitive market the textile market uh once we drop them in the ocean of trading, they figured it out very, very quickly. Uh, and if they didn't, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll show, let me show you some things here. Uh, can I? Can I ask? You to yes. So you mentioned earlier that penalties in command and control are not feasible for some reason. Uh, so now I don't understand why the penalty if you don't have enough. That is enforceable. I mean, it's, it's well, so, sorry. What, what? Why could we enforce a penalty here? Yeah, I mean, there are two financial penalties. It doesn't matter where they're coming from. So I was confused a little bit. Clearly. So in the so the problem in the status quo is that there aren't financial penalties. I, that's my view. Uh, the basically the only penalty is like the sledgehammer. Uh, I'll shut you down, uh, and that's what the regulator could do. But imposing financial penalties for missing the standard or something like that, it didn't really exist. The only thing they could do was uh, shut them down. And there's lots of political pressure on the regulator not to shut them down. The plants don't want to be shut down. Uh, it all feels very uh, irregular and uh, kind of aggressive, uh, overly aggressive. And so here, we basically have a continuous financial penalty. Well, it's not written into law, well, you, you have to write a new law. I mean, yes, uh, if we have if the freedom of. Uh, so, I can't understand why this thing works. Working in the market is that uh, the firms are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, no, no. So, this is a very important question. Uh, the, I think, think of the treatment as a multi-dimensional vector. Uh, and I'm, we're not gonna be able to isolate which element of that vector was the most important. Was it the better monitoring? Uh, was it the continuous financial penalties? Uh, was it that this was uh, some kind of halo effect because this was a special thing? I don't think that one is true, but so there's like a variety of features of this. Uh, and I think you, you just have to think of it as a bundle. It would be preferable if I could identify, I would need different experiments to identify all those uh, separate parts. Uh, so this bundle is what we're, I'm gonna be able to tell you about. Uh, okay, so here's, uh, uh, okay, so th this is uh, emissions uh, over, divided by uh, permit holdings. Uh, and this is, uh, okay, so what you would like, so we said, is at the end of the period for that to be 100. Uh, that's what 
you would predict uh, should be the case. Uh, you shouldn't hold, if you held more permits than you emit it, uh, those are wasted permits. Uh, you should have sold them back into the marketplace and someone should have used them to emit. Uh, if you held too few, then, uh, then you're really in trouble. You should be really in trouble because you're threatening the fidelity of the market. And so you think everything should be 100. So here it is in week one. Uh, and this is, it's really, uh, I talked about this this morning, like how disappointing data can be. This is not an instance of disappointing data. Uh, and so now here's week two. Uh, you remember they're all getting allocated a lot in week one. Uh, and the thing is starting to move closer to 100. This is week four, week five, week six. And there it is at the end of the thing. Uh, and so some guys were making mistakes in the first period. This should never happen. Those are permits that they should have sold. Uh, and they just didn't have it together to sell them. Uh, but you can see the vast majority of plants are right at 100. Uh, and so in terms of is the market functioning well, and we, even in period one, I thought this was pretty good evidence. Uh, now we're going to, the unspent one was about 1.5%. Uh, now let's look at period 10. There was period two, period three, period four, period five, all the way to 10 when they get pretty good at this. And you can see basically nobody's making a mistake at the end, we're down to about 3% and everyone's lined up right at 100. And these guys who are testing the system uh, have now accepted the, uh, that the system is real. So that's one measure of was the market functioning well. Another one is uh, in the laziest version of this, guys are gonna get their permits at the beginning of the period. Uh, and uh, they got their 80% uh, eighty percent allocated, uh, and uh, maybe they would pro rata from the auctions in the beginning, uh, split the other 20%, and everyone would end uh, with uh, emissions, uh, at maybe divided by permit allocations, uh, as if nothing, as if no trading had happened, oh, if no trading happened. And what you can see is actually, people end up at very different places by the end. Uh, some people have emissions that are way smaller than their initial permit allocations. That's these guys. Uh, some people have uh, emissions that are way larger than their permit allocations. Those in principle are people who found it very expensive uh, to abate. And so they're gonna buy permits from these guys. Uh, and then you can see the same thing is uh, true in period 10. So like, this is not like a decisive, we kind of got a collage of evidence on how the market works are working. Here's a, another piece of evidence. Uh, it is also true that there was a, <clears throat> it looks like there was a fair amount of trading. Uh, obviously the most was in that first day uh, with the auctions, uh, but then you can see every day that there's trading and uh, even on the non-auction days, there can be pretty high volume relative to the uh, overall float. Um, Here's the permit prices. <clears throat> you can see in the beginning, actually, the circles are the average bid, uh, and these lines uh, the equilibrium price. Uh, and you can see actually they weren't they weren't great at uh, the bid was a little bit too high in the beginning. People were learning their marginal abatement costs, uh, and by the end, their marginal abatement costs uh, are pretty close to what the equilibrium price or their bids are pretty close to what the equilibrium price is. Uh, and so you can, it feels like you can see the learning happening uh, uh, across these compliance periods. Um, uh, here's just the dates of how it worked and <clears throat> these different points at which the cap went down. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So there are 13, these do. As I said, they do about $13 million uh, of sales per year. No, but you use very well describing the individual firm as explanatory. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's something we're working on. But, uh, yeah, that's something we're working on. But I'm going to say, uh, I'm just going to pick on you since you're asking good questions. Uh, I don't care. Uh, because... No, 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 listen, no, listen, no, no, hear me out, hear me out. I'm going to, let, let's just, remember, I teach at the University of Chicago. Uh, the power of the market here is it doesn't matter. 
they all know better than you do. They know better than the regulator does. The reason you want that is because you think that you know how to allocate emissions across those plants. Uh, no, no, I'm going to put that in your, on you. And instead, what we're going to do is we're going to let the power of the invisible hand have people reveal, uh, do their bids, uh, what their marginal abatement costs are. Instead of correlating it with, are you is the owner left-handed or is he an owner of the textile association or things like that. No, no, there's no, what political pressure here? No, 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 there's no, 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 no. This is, these are, they're, uh, they're trading on a real exchange uh, through on a computer screen. Uh, no one is ordering them to do trades. Uh, and I'm gonna show you what we're gonna be able to infer. I think it's a very exciting thing is we're gonna be able to infer their marginal abatement cost curves from their bids. And I'm gonna show you the heterogeneity in them. And I'm gonna defy you uh, to tell me that the heterogeneity that we're gonna uncover could have ever been predicted by anybody. Should I correlate it with some covariance? Yes, and we will do that. But I'm gonna use you as a rhetorical device in this talk. Okay. There's no market power. Or... No, no, the largest guy's 4% of the whole thing. Uh, so, but it's a good concern. And no take market, enough take. It looks like it. I mean, we didn't know, but it looks like it. And the price settled at five? Floor five, ceiling a hundred, and then we let bids determine it. But so you know, effectively, when you're at the floor, what the plants are trying to tell you is there's too many permits, and so the uh, regulator will just start purchase made an agreement that they would purchase uh, as many as people wanted to sell at five. Well, yeah, yeah. These companies, uh, in terms of their compliance, because uh, for certain industries like cement industry, uh, uh, the marginal cost of abatement um, might be very very high. So they would want to purchase this more. So uh, and uh, would it be able to like focus the market to particular industry? So here's what I'll say. 85% of them were the same industry. And actually we were worried about that. So let me pick on my friend again here. Uh, we were worried about that because uh, we thought they would be too similar. Uh, and there wouldn't be heterogeneity in abatement costs and it would not be possible to get trades because of that. Uh, and so what I'm gonna show you is even when they're all, this is like the beauty of markets, even when they're all, practically all, 85% in the same industry, uh, there's still very important differences uh, that are not, uh, that we don't know how to have predicted in advance. Uh, I do want to remind you one thing. Uh, the regulator forced everyone to hold air pollution control devices in advance. Uh, and so really the action is going to be on the variable costs uh, of operating that equipment or finding some process innovation or something like that. Uh, I think a lot of us have in the back of our mind Plants are going to rethink how they re do everything. And that's not true here uh, because everybody already had these requirements to uh, install this expensive pollution abatement equipment. This is close by. Why would they just make a cartel or collude or something like that? Because they all know each other, they're nearby, and they sort of, yeah, the same industry. I mean, maybe you have a cartel um, against the regulator? A price fixing or something, I mean, you know, over beer, well, it's Gujarat, so no beer. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, how how yeah. they would collude, right? I mean, uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, some subset would try to have market power and impose yeah. it on everyone else. Uh, you didn't so, see it. We didn't see that. Okay. So, uh, yes, some could have tried to collude together. Uh, Okay, and then, uh, so I'm putting this here, the emissions market surprisingly reduced pollution. I say surprisingly, because we tried to design it so that pollution would be constant across the two. Uh, and here you can see this. What is the estimation? Yeah, 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 you asked me this morning. This one's so simple, you're gonna love this one. Uh, pollution equals treatment. Maybe with some time fixed effects. 
it's an intention to fit a thing. They are about complete compliance. Uh, you were either in the market or you weren't. Okay. I mean, what Professor Chikan asked that for all who are at, who are assigned to the treatment, did all of them comply? Uh, they had to. It wasn't a choice. They weren't in charge. Yeah, so 100%. Uh, the ITE is the same thing as the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so the blue guys are pollution. So, uh, sorry, the blue guys are treatment. The black guys are uh, control. You can see there's no real difference before the market starts. Uh, and then uh, you can see that throughout, uh, the blue guys had lower levels of pollution. Uh, Pre-COVID, post-COVID, uh, pre Delta, post Delta, uh, and it's always about 20%. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a good question. <laughs> it's a, uh, so we did have year months fix effects. Um, now we didn't have complete compliance on operating the SEMS machines, uh, and it was worse in the control group. And so if you just, uh, uh, if you don't do any imputation, it's about 20 log points. If you do some imputation, we tried a different, a couple different techniques and we tried some reweighting. Uh, you can make it up, you can have it go up to maybe 30 log points. Uh, so it looks to us like there's about a 20 to 30% uh, reduction uh, in, in emissions. Um, okay. So then result three. So that's result two. Then result three is, well, the real reason people operate these things, at least traditionally when people think about them, is a way to reduce compliance costs. Uh, and so now, actually, the fact that we have a reduction in pollution is a little bit complicated uh, because that means one is facing a more stringent form of regulation than another, which happened to be the treatment group. Uh, and so how would we hold stringency constant? Uh, and uh, the way we tried to do that uh, is uh, we have all the uh, we, we the object that we're going to aim at here are each firm's marginal abatement cost function, okay? Uh, and that is telling you how expensive it is for them uh, to reduce emissions uh, a, a, an extra unit at a time. Uh, and it's, you'll see it's not linear. Um, once we have that. Uh, then uh, we can do any kind of factual exercise known to man. Uh, and the one that we're going to focus on is let's compare all the plants uh, in the treatment group, how expensive it was uh, for them to comply with the market versus how expensive it would be if they faced a 20 to 30% more stringent uh, concentration standard than the control plants uh, did. Uh, so did I say that? in a clear way okay and so we're gonna have to do a little manipulation uh to get that but that's the game plan but the key thing is to get the marginal abatement cost functions and i'm going to explain how we do that uh so the first thing i'll just note uh is we did do try to do a standard experimental thing which is just measure uh can we uh can we see uh any changes in abatement capital it would be very surprising uh, since the regular had kind of already mandated that everyone have uh, their abatement capital. Uh, and in fact, we see no evidence of uh, changes in uh, total abatement capital, no changes in air pollution control, expenditures on air pollution control devices or in expenditures on any of the categories, uh, particular categories. Uh, so that was kind of a bust. We expected it to be a bust. It turned out to be a bust. Uh, and so what that left us with is, well, can we use, uh, uh, can we use the uh, bidding data uh, where the plants are revealing how much they're willing to buy and sell for uh, to develop these marginal bid cost functions? Uh, and uh, let me try to, I'm gonna skip this, uh, explain how we did that. Uh, okay, so here's just some, summary data on the bids just so you have a sense of it uh in period one there were about 15, uh 1500 bids uh for a total of and these are bids to buy and sell uh for the total quantities in uh kgs 
the bid price, this is the average bid price, and you can see we have all this information uh, for each period, and we're gonna have it plant, uh, plant by plant, but here's just some uh, summaries. Um, we looked at this. Uh, okay, I'm gonna skip, this is just like boring math to get us to, maybe we can use uh, the plant's bids uh, to learn something uh, about their marginal abatement cost function. Uh, and uh, the way we're gonna do that, uh, I mean, so this is just uh, math that says what plants wanna do uh, is minimize their compliance costs, uh, minimize, uh, minimize their compliance costs, which is gonna be a function of their emissions. Uh, and uh, that if you take uh, the derivative abatement, uh, abatement cost emissions, uh, that'll give you their uh, marginal abatement cost. Uh, and in the market case, uh, what is so powerful about the market is that all plants will set their marginal abatement costs equal to P, the same P. Uh, and that is the beauty of the power of the invisible hand. You don't actually have to know. Uh, the regular doesn't have to know everyone's marginal abatement cost function. Uh, the market will get everyone uh, to the same uh, place without having to know that. Okay, uh, so the way we're gonna try and get the marginal abatement cost function is to use the bids. Uh, the second uh, thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna predict the pollution load of the treatment plants if they had been in the status quo regime. Uh, and so we're gonna, take the control plants, uh, even though everyone had the same 150 micrograms per cubic meter concentration standard, in practice, they had very different standards for a variety of reasons, some of which are probably above board and some of which might not have been above board. And so we're gonna take their characteristics and uh, regress the actual concentration standard they faced against their characteristics, use those regression results apply them in the treatment group. And now we have uh, a concentration standard uh, in the treatment group. And once we have a concentration standard in the treatment group, then we can get the total load, which was the question we had earlier, uh, which is the product of the assigned pollution standard, the assumption they're working 16 hours a day and the flow rate uh, 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 of the stack gas. Um, uh, that's gonna allow us to determine the total variable abatement costs in both the emissions market and in the status quo uh, regime for these plants. Okay, so here uh, is what I think is really exciting uh, is you'll be happy. We're gonna estimate the bid, uh, the outcome variable uh, will be the bid. It's gonna be a function uh, of their emissions. It's gonna be log log. Uh, and we'll also have, uh, uh, I think those are, uh, period fixed effects, uh, IT, almost positive. Yeah, BITK is a uh, plant I at period T. Uh, and so, uh, oh, so we're gonna have plant by period fixed effects. Sorry, I should say that. Uh, so if the plant is having a cost shock that varies across the compliance periods, we're gonna regress that out. Uh, and then we're gonna say all bids around that uh, uh, fixed effect are going to reveal uh, the uh, are, are, are going to real, reveal the marginal abatement cost function, uh, and so the key thing is that we're allowing for this plant by period heterogeneity and abatement cost, uh, and uh, we're going to use uh, conditional on that uh, we can recover these marginal abatement cost functions, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, you know if you don't include those period by plant fixed effects. Uh, you have a uh, smaller elasticity, uh, and uh, this is the one we're going to focus on where we have the plant by period fixed effects. And so this is from the regression of the bid price uh, on, on, on emissions. Okay, now I want to give you a, a sense, just so you feel like I didn't do magic there. Let's like look at the raw data. So here's one plant. Uh, this is their ID in the Gujarat Pollution Control Board system. I think this is a real name, but I'm not positive. Uh, or, or maybe we had to obscure it and make it a fake name. But the triangle is uh, by bids and the circle are, uh, the circles 
our uh, cell bids. Uh, and you can see this plant in this one period, I think this is uh, period compliance period eight, these are the various bids they made. Uh, now, this is uh, the line that goes through that based on the estimation of this equation, or not the line, but the uh, function that goes through that. Uh, and so what you should read this is, we're using these bids uh, to recover the plant's marginal abatement cost function. And so, Let's say that in English, like if they went from 5,000 kg to 4,000, uh, the cost of doing that would be the area underneath that triangle. Uh, you can see uh, when you get, as you start to get cleaner and cleaner and take more and more out, uh, you can see that the response function is getting steeper and steeper, exactly what you would expect. Like it's easiest to get rid of the first unit of pollution than it is uh, the very last unit of pollution. Okay, so, does that make sense? So, Michael, the action is only from the variable cost. A hundred percent, because of uh, this uh, uh, requirement that the capital cost is already all mandated. So, I'm wondering about this smooth function because variable cost could be electricity, which is same uh, uh, wages. So, it, it, it's wages. It's process uh, changes. Some of them okay. made some process changes. Uh, some of them, uh, there's maintenance of the machine. Uh, I, I agree. This is a pretty tightly constrained setting. Yeah. And, but so far, I haven't told I haven't told anything about heterogeneity yet. This is just one plant, right? Sometimes you, when you see these kinds of uh, work, you see more like step shape marginal abatement costs. Because oh, well, so I'm fitting this smooth okay. function through yeah. it. I mean, that's because you would have. Yeah. I think that's actually right. absolutely right. But this is like a gross uh, representation of the truth here, yeah. which comes out of this, right? Okay. It, it is the bids that are disciplining this. They're discrete, right? So that's right. Yes. But remember, and remember, I'm identifying, I do have a fixed effect for each plant, but I am identifying a slope across all the different plants. That's why you're getting the... That's where the smoothness is coming from. But that's it's a very important question. Okay, now I'm gonna do some, start to do some cool things here. Oh, here's the second plant. Uh, uh, and here's the function for that guy. Uh, okay, uh, so just, now I got 160 of the, or 107, whatever, 160, 170s. We can do this for each of the plants uh, in, in, in the market. I'm gonna show you that as we go along. Uh, now. Uh, okay, so how are we going to solve? So, the, sorry, the next step uh, is to get the pollution market cost curve. Okay, and so remember what the market wants to do: it wants to assign uh, abatement. It wants to search across all the plants and all their marginal abatement cost functions and find the cheapest unit of abatement, and then search for the second. Uh, cheapest unit and add that all the way up. Uh, and so that's how you would build the pollution market uh, cost curve. Uh, and uh, you would then uh, effectively, you would you'd solve for the equilibrium price uh, and you would see where everyone was located on their marginal abatement cost curve. Then. Uh, uh, and then that's going to give you uh, the total emissions, the function of the market equilibrium price. Uh, So this is the input. There's 160 of those that are inputs. Uh, you take the overall cap, uh, and then you can solve for the price that's going to give it. Okay, and that will assign different amounts of abatement. That price will assign different amounts of abatement to each of the 160 firms. Okay, when we took that model of how it should work. Uh, these are the equilibrium prices uh, that we predict it would prevail. Does that make sense? Now, remember, we actually have the equilibrium prices too, so we don't just have to rely on that model. Uh, that's what those guys are. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, I would call them pretty close, uh, but remember in the beginning, 
these plants were all bidding too high. And so you can see that uh, here's the bids, uh, the mean bids. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's in the later periods uh, when the model started to reproduce uh, exactly what the market was giving. Uh, and I think that is at least consistent with the idea that the firms are learning about their marginal abatement cost curves uh, as time goes by. Um, okay, when you add all that together uh, uh, and then add up the abatement cost for each of the 160 plants, 170 plants, uh, you can get uh, this here, which is the market wide uh, abatement cost curve. This is uh, from the emissions market. There are uh, total emissions across all the plants, uh, and that's a total variable cost. Uh, we're not saying anything about fixed costs. Uh, okay, and so piece of this, now we wanna do the same thing if those plants were not allowed to trade and they all faced uh, concentration standards. Uh, uh, and when uh, this is, I kind of explained this in words already, where we're getting the counterfactual standard that they would have faced. Uh, and when you do that, you can get, this is the command and control emissions market, total emissions market wide, if each of them had been uh, forced to uh, achieve their compliance standard and not uh, allowed to trade. And so this is the uh, emissions market one you saw. This is in the status quo. And what I just want you to see next uh, is, and so this is with a, a, a cap of 240 tons, uh, that if you wanted to hold total compliance costs uh, constant, what this is saying, uh, is you could have a very like 50% reduction in pollution, or if you wanted to hold uh, emissions constant, you could have about a 15% uh, reduction in uh, compliance cost. Um, and that's what those two things say. You can do the same exercise at a, a sharper cap. Uh, it's maybe 12% or 50% there. Uh, I think the most important thing possibly to take away from this is how uh, whatever the opposite of sharply, modestly sloped this is. Uh, what this is saying is that if you wanted to have very large reductions in pollution, this would not be very expensive to achieve. Uh, and uh, I don't think this was known before, but now you know we have this information uh, uh, from, from, from this market. They do convert, yeah, convert it. Yeah, they do convert it. Um, Okay, I wanna come back to this. I think this is really fascinating. Uh, so here, this is the clearing price uh, in uh, the market. Uh, and this is marginal abatement cost curve. I would never wanna uh, abate beyond this because they would rather just buy permits uh, since uh, uh, it would cost them more up here to abate. Uh, than it would to just go uh, to the secondary market and buy permits. Uh, and now I want you to look in the status quo, and you can see in the status quo, this plant would have been forced to abate all the way to here. Does that make sense? Okay, and if it's forced to abate all the way there, that's no good for them uh, relative to being in the market because they find it, they find it pretty expensive uh, to get there. And so what you can see is that under command and control, all the area under here is their compliance costs. Uh, and now let's see if I got the colors right, yeah. Uh, uh, what the market is offering them uh, is this orangish or reddish uh, thing, which is the gains they can get uh, from buying permits rather than doing the abatement themselves. Okay, so this is like, this kind of graph is in every cap and trade illustration in a textbook, uh, but this is actually with, you know, real data. Uh, here is another plant, this other plant we looked at before. You're gonna see why I chose them. These guys find it really, really cheap to abate pollution. Uh, and at the market clearing price, they're actually happy uh, to abate far beyond, or somewhat far beyond what they would have abated just, uh, uh, with the concentration standard, and they get to make all this extra money. So it costs them this, but then they get to sell at the dotted line, 
and this is pure profit for them. And so, like, this is a pollution market working. Uh, here's our two plants. Oh, this is 160 plants. Uh, oh, okay. So now I'm going to uh, contradict myself. I was picking on you earlier. Uh, I did color these, uh, I forgot, by uh, how big their boiler was. So, so you can't see it, but there's maybe you can see these are each, there's 160 lines here. Uh, and the, uh, the dark colors are the big guys with bigger boilers. So that's basically what this is saying. So your intuition, you, sh you should have been the regulator. You should have been the social planner. <laughs> no, I know, but you're helping me make my point. So I'm going to keep using you. <laughs> uh, and you can, so you can, and you know, what's also cool is you can see some of these plants, uh, even at zero abatement, they can't, you know, they're, they're just not big enough to pollute all the way out there. Uh, and so this is the this is the heterogeneity that I'm arguing. Uh, no regulator, no social planner, nobody could have ever known. And the point is being made: this is pretty constrained heterogeneity. They're 85 percent in the same industry, uh, uh, and uh, they can't really alter with their make capital decisions. Uh, and yet, you're still getting uh, uh, these savings from the market. Okay, uh, this is just the same things we saw earlier. Oh, and this is just making the point, you know, if you really want that big reductions in pollution, it's not very expensive, given that these guys already installed all this equipment already. Okay, uh, so, oh, and then here's a little cost benefit analysis that we put together. Uh, suppose this were scaled up. Uh, there's about, 900 plants in principle, this could be scaled up to in Surat or an extra 600. Uh, yeah, about 900. Uh, so imagine they all did. Uh, it would cost uh, about 310 million rupees uh, to do that for the monitoring costs. Uh, the headline reduction in pollution you would get from that, given stationary sources contribution from a source apportionment study to pollution in Gujra, uh, in Surat is you get about five and a half micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5. That's a lot. That's like almost a WHO standard by itself. Uh, uh, so, and the way you get that is the following steps. You assume about a 20% treatment effect. Uh, you take the source apportionment study saying that those plants count for about 28 micrograms per cubic meter. 0.2 times that gives you 5.5. Uh, assume that it's applied to all the plants in the city, and that's how you get to 5.5. Uh, you can use the value of Cisco Life uh, uh, to turn it into dollars uh, using what we looked at earlier today on the relationship from China, on the relationship between PM uh, 2.5 and life expectancy, uh, and given the number of people in Surat. Uh, one thing leads to another, and you you you, know, you get this kind of like insane benefit to cost ratio, about a hundred to one. Uh, so I would say going back to the first question I posed, uh, is it that the benefits of doing this are too small? I don't think that's true. Uh, the benefits are very high. It appears like the costs are on the execution side. Uh, and uh, finding a regulatory tool that could deliver these uh, reductions uh, in pollution. Okay, uh, so you know, just to summarize, the emissions market functioned pretty well. It surprisingly, at least relative to our efforts to design it, reduced pollution. It also reduced abatement costs, uh, and I think it's an important proof of concept. Uh, that for environmental markets and emerging economies, uh, which had several features to it, hard to isolate the impact of any one of them. Uh, and where is this going? Uh, Gujarat is scaling this up 
uh, 170 control plants are being put into the market, maybe on January 1st. Uh, they're starting a second market in Ahmedabad. Uh, and uh, we signed an MOU with the uh, chief minister to help them set up a carbon market, uh, all based on uh, taking this wacky idea, which people knew was true in other settings and were uncertain about whether or not uh, it would work uh, uh, in this setting. And there's now evidence of this working in this setting. So, okay, so that's stock. Be happy to answer any questions. So the geographic area is small enough to not worry about uniformly dispersed pollutants. Yeah. Surat is a small, it's basically one yeah. area. Yeah. So if you were to, uh, so these are cities and these are probably sources. They'd be separate markets. The Ahmedabad will be a separate market. Yeah. So now I'm trying to convince them uh, to have trading ratios. Okay. Uh, and so to allow trading to get more heterogeneity into the market. You then you need the dispersion models yep. and the, all that stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. So but, that's not impossible to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in principle, it can be done. And for carbon, then there is really no problem. Carbon doesn't matter. But where is the cap? Where are the regulations and the cap for carbon? For carbon? Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are none right now. So it'll be some voluntary kind of a cap, right? Uh, I think you could imagine running a pilot in uh, Gujarat. Yeah. Uh, we'd have to get special authority from the MOEF. But it would be similar because it's again coal and, you know, I mean, the, the, the fuel is more or less the same, right? So oh, it's uh, it's so much easier for CO2. Uh, the mo All the monitoring drama goes out the window. Yeah, because you just know the If you tell me the fuels you use, I know your CO2. Yeah, yeah, okay. And they all have to report the fuels uh, through, other, uh, through other avenues. Much easier, much easier. Much easier for SOX too. I'm just thinking about the fixed costs. I haven't really thought this through, but since the fixed costs are there and they're somewhat different, right, for these different plants, so is there a scale economy or something going on there? I don't know. Oh, why is there such large heterogeneity given the fixed costs are set? Yeah. I don't have a super precise answer for you. Uh, you know, I I'll hide behind my cargo thing of like uh there's a lot of heterogeneity in the world and social planner can't know it okay thanks but but you know uh they're trying to tell you me through the bids that there is heterogeneity that's what they're revealing okay thank you michael for the nice presentation and still we are well ahead of time and it was roughly around 10 minutes we have if you have any question, please raise your hand. Yeah. So when when the market unfolds and there's a lot of trading, uh, what are the implications of this on the eventual market structure? Is it going to make some firms more powerful because they they the ones who are buying? Uh, is there some kind of profit transfer happening? Uh, change in composition. Of profits just do you think you're, the question is does it affect the product market no uh, so the, 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 there's an existing distribution of profits uh, across these firms is this trading in any way going to have implications on uh how these profits are going to play out everyone should do better you can see the guys who found it expensive to abate uh did better because now they could buy instead of doing this expensive abatement and the Guys who found it cheap to abate. Uh, but, but the ones who are, uh, everyone's getting better, but are some people getting disproportionately more better? And, and Yeah, but we probably want that. Uh, those are guys who are clever and figuring out cheap ways to abate. We want that. We want everyone to get smarter about it. Okay. Unleashing the power of the market. Will it have implications on market power and change the... So uh, there was an important question about market power. Uh, the biggest one just had 4% of the market. Mm -hmm. We were concerned about that. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, just to sort of go back to something that was said, um, we don't quite know whether the emissions markets did this, right? I mean, the ideal experiment would be to say that, you know, we look at the financial penalties, the better monitoring. And we kind of do an experiment where 
there's one group in which we have the command and control, one group which has command and control with financial penalties, and then one where there's emissions market, and then we see what works. So can we really attribute these results to the emissions market? That's my question. I'm just going to say I got a policy effect, which is a bundle of things. Uh, and uh, it's good enough for me. Uh, and like, I think, you know, in the back of our minds, uh, I think we all have the idea of this concentration standard or command and control as being the actual, and then little freedom uh, on inside the market on how they get it. Uh, it's not really how it works. Like, every, almost, I think every, almost every cap and trade, maybe every cap and trade that I'm aware of, also has regulations under the cap. Uh, I, it's obviously not the most economically efficient thing to do, uh, but they all have some requirements for this that they must also do this, install this, or you must install that. So the textbook example is a little artificial relative to the real world. That's what I'm trying to say. I see. N not just in Gujarat. <laughs> I told you the equation already. <laughs> no, this is not about equations. This is about. Uh, so, uh, why do you think the Gujarat government wanted to reduce pollution? Why did I think they wanted to reduce pollution? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I guess. Like... <laughs> Hold on, it's coming. It's less dramatic when it takes this long. That's Surat. Yeah. So, no, but there is, but as you said, CO2 emission, these are externalities. These are externalities. So why will a oh, state why, care? Why do they want to do CO2? Yeah. Oh, 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 I thought you meant PM. Why do they want to do CO2? Yeah. Uh, because the central government called them and said, uh, the prime minister promised this uh, thing, uh, and now you have to do your share. That's <laughs> okay. why. So so it was a BJP rule state, so that's why they wanted to yeah. <laughs> follow the PM. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The Prime Minister did this on the international stage. Now we have to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Yeah. Any more question? Okay. All right. So uh, I once again uh, thank you, you know, Michael, for this very nice and engaging presentation. And with this, I conclude this session. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>